I want to continue on the subject of God's love for all mankind. Um, what about, you could, as an alternative title, call it, what about the people in Africa, Asia, China, the jungles of South America, whatever. So this would be part two of God's love for all mankind. And I want to read that scripture that I used as a text in the previous session. Psalm 98 verses 2 to 3. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he's revealed in the sight of the nations. And all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Now that's what the scripture declares. Now, if, of course, if you don't believe that, and if your mind can't wrap, your, wrap around that truth, well then that's your problem, but it's not God's. He's just telling us that he's reached all the ends of the earth. So a close study of the Old Testament that we saw with our 12 examples has shown that God is willing and well able to reach all nations at all times through his people, at least, certainly through creation and the inner conscience, but through his people as well, the Jewish people that he called out. Here's another great reflection on the matter as our introduction to today's session. Zechariah chapter 8 verses 20 to 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from every language of the nations, every language of the nations, shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, Let us go with you. For we've heard that God is with you. Now, isn't that interesting? That's an Old Testament revelation in those times. What about the New Testament now? Would it be any different in New Testament times? I'm going to show from a number of examples that God reaches out via his people in the New Testament as well to the whole world. But let's begin with a reminder of some foundational scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read about um, the early disciples being called to be witnesses to Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, first of all, the local sphere of influence, then in all Judea, a broader sphere of influence, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Wow, interesting. So beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Romans chapter 1 verse 8 talks about the gospel being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Now that's God's perspective because our perspective, we ask these hypotheticals, what about the people in? Now we've never been there, we haven't been to all the ends of the earth, but God has, he is there, he's been there and always uh, has a better perspective. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 1 puts it this way, creation um, can be seen by all at all times and testifies about God, that we can come to know the invisible God through those things that are visible. Interesting. The stars, the constellations, the sun, the moon, just all of the stuff that we see so brilliantly portrayed by modern technology, the photographs and the Hubble space you know, telescope and then microscopes too on a micro scale. It's just incredible. Creation can be seen by all at all times, and it testifies about God. Then over in Colossians chapter 1 is another foundational scripture. In verses 5 through 6 and verse 23, it talks about the good news of Jesus Christ and his supremacy being spread to, quote-unquote, all the world, and then proclaimed in all creation under heaven. So the opportunity for all mankind at all times is available to get to know God. Now, the specific examples that I want to share with you uh, from the New Testament, you know, uh, writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Book of Acts, Romans, the letters, all the way through to Revelations, are as follows. Number one, the Magi, or the wise men, you've heard about the, the wise men who brought their three gifts. They came from the East, um, and uh, this is how it reads in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, that's, uh, they were in search of, you know, with the star, you know, the story with the star. 
They were in search of the Messiah that was born. They were uh, what we would call today astronomers more than astrologers. Now, astrologers look at the stars, um, as do astronomers, but astrologers are kind of uh, soothsayers or, or, you know, they, they mix a, a spiritual element into things, uh, especially in modern times that is, that is just not of God. But astronomers just look at the stars, look at the sun and the moon and the planets and, you know, everything back then uh, as, as we do today, and they just marvel at it, um, scientifically speaking. But these wise men, um, there was a spiritual component, you know, just to be sure, uh, involved in it, because they, were, they saw uh, the story of the gospel in the stars. You know, the 12 constellations, and there's Libra, and there's Scorpio, and there's Leo, and, and the, the symbolism there ties in with the gospel story. It's incredible. But they were guided by the star, just to keep it short now. And they probably came from the fertile crescent lands between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians, that's, that's Iraq and Iran, and the, 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 the civilizations of that time that were influenced by the Jewish exiles, people like Daniel that interpreted dreams, and some say started a school of prophets there, and you know probably had an influence on these wise men or magi that eventually came later on in Jesus' time, uh, to Jerusalem to, to seek him out. So that we've got an incredible influence and, and, and reach into the world at that time, certainly the power centers of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians um, in that time. Now, moving to a second example, a New Testament example. On the day of Pentecost, this is now 50 days after Jesus' um, resurrection, the special feast of Pentecost, People, Jews and proselytes, people that had been converted from the Gentile nations into Jews, they came from all around the world and uh, witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the special day of Pentecost. The disciples were filled with the Spirit, began to speak in tongues of all these languages and everything like that, and they spilled out into the streets and had an incredible impact on, on Jerusalem at that time. And so we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 5, the following scripture that points to my point that I'm making is that God uses his people to reach just the whole world. Jews, Acts 2 verse 5, Jews from every nation under heaven, get that, every nation under heaven, had returned and were now living in Jerusalem. So it seems as if God had drawn his people back to Jerusalem at that time. And it's reasonable that they still had contact back in their um, original nations from which they came. And in all likelihood, they became part and parcel of the spread of Christianity as they went back to those nations with this incredible news that the Holy Spirit had been poured out, that Jesus had been crucified and raised from the dead, and it's just, just the cataclysmic events of the day that they experienced. It's Jews from every nation under heaven heard and experienced and witnessed this incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God is incredibly strategic in what he does. And uh, certainly in that day, and certainly in our times today, he does things, um, cities are strategic places in a nation. Port cities, New York, Seattle, Los Angeles, uh, you name it. Um, overseas, back in the day, Asia Minor, and I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit in one of the examples I want to bring up here. But nevertheless, uh, that's the story on the day of Pentecost. The third example from the New Testament times, uh, modern day dreams and visions are given. And we trace back the roots to this passage of scripture here in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, so this is God now, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh, all flesh, all manner of flesh, everybody. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, that sounds like a cute story from back in the day, but um, surprising, uh, surprisingly enough, 
uh, many, many, many testimonies are now given in the 20th and 21st century of Muslims in Muslim lands that are not typically open to uh, uh, a verbal and direct communication of the gospel. They're experiencing dreams and visions of the risen Christ and are coming to Christ by means of these dreams and visions that God prophesied about in their droves. Many, many of them. Interesting stuff, how God's able to reach people over there somewhere. Incredible. Fourth example, the Apostle Thomas back, you know, remember doubting Thomas of the, of the 12, 12 disciples or apostles? Well, after he had an encounter with the risen Christ and had things explained to him and had the opportunity to believe fully in the truth of Jesus' resurrection, he went off, as church history records, all the way to modern-day India. And he reached there before 100 AD, a time, time period of 100 AD. And traditionally, um, he reached a place called Muziris, M-U-Z-I-R-I-S, as early as 52 AD. That's just a few short years after Jesus um, was raised from the dead. And he baptized many who are known today as St. Thomas Christians or Nazranis. This is in India. Today, you can go there, you can historically look it up. Uh, back in the day, at the time where Apostle uh, Thomas lived, both land, trade, and sea routes to India were available at that time. And he, he made use of the opportunity to get all the way to India. So God was reaching out not only in Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem, obviously, but to the ends of the earth. And here we've got India thousands of miles away. Apostle Thomas gets there. Amazing. And the influence reached all the way down to the 21st century. A fifth example, Cornelius, the Roman centurion. This is a Gentile nation, now the Romans. And the centurion is part of the occupying... Um, soldiers in the region. And God uses a vision and an angel and the Apostle Peter to reach this Roman centurion who's a, an influential officer in the, in the Roman cohort. In Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 3 it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household. Interestingly, the God of heaven, even though he was under Caesar's employ and they had all their issues there with um, you know, worshipping Caesar and the way they did things in, in Rome at that time, but he was able to navigate his way in his career and remain a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. He had an influence over the house, whole household. And who gave alms generously to the people that's the Jewish people, but in context. And pray to God always. Pray to God always. So here's a godly man who's operating with the knowledge that he's, that he's got. Old Testament knowledge. And, and yet God uses the Apostle Peter to reach him by means of you know, visions and trances and things, supernatural stuff like that. So about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and the story unfolds where he sends representatives to call on Peter, who's in a trance, and you know God tells him to go and uh, witness to these uh, Gentile people, and the whole household gets saved, they get filled with the Spirit, they speak in tongues. It's just a just a wonderful and glorious um, occasion where God just phew, just blasts open the kind of insular Jewish approach to evangelism at that time. It was just to the Jews only, and I didn't really get this whole thing about the Gentiles um, being reached and with the gospel. And here, Peter is just launched into a new dimension of that understanding. Okay, moving along to chapter 8 now in the book of Acts, with the sixth example, the Ethiopian eunuch, um, all the way from Ethio, Ethiopia, He's a eunuch, he's a, kind of like a prime minister or minister of finance or whatever, uh, to Queen Candace of the 
the Ethiopians. And he goes off to Jerusalem to pay respects at one of the feasts there. And um, he gets evangelized by Philip the Evangelist. The record picks up at verse 26 through to 28. It says this, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So Philip's an evangelist. He's hanging around town. He's doing his thing in the cities and the villages and so on. But now God leads him by means of this um, angelic uh, visitation to go to this desert place in modern-day Gaza. As we understand it, you know, the trade routes would follow there and they would cut across into Egypt and then down south to, to Ethiopia in Africa on the east side. So Philip arises, the scripture continues to say, and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. So this is strategic once again. Um, influential person under Queen Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, her charge of all her treasury, so like the financial minister, had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. He obviously had a scroll, you know. And so his life had been impacted all the way in Ethiopia back in that time. So the, the, the outreach of God and his ways and his prophecies had reached into Ethiopia and Africa. And um, Ethiopia, we know historically, um, has had an impact on, on African history at that time. And even to the extent that in, in modern times, some Ethiopians claim to even have a, the Ark of the Covenant and so on. And many of them have even migrated back to Jerusalem and Ethiopian Jews, black African Ethiopian Jews. Uh, landed up in Israel. Some of them have walked and found their way and been able to navigate their way through all of the, the lands there, walking through Egypt and the Sinai and landed up, boom, on the doorstep of Israel and let us in. We want to be, want to be part of the modern nation of Israel. It's fascinating, the influence and reach that God had. But here's a, this New Testament example. He returns, he gets baptized, he gets saved. You know, Philip, you know, witnesses to him. He gets baptized in water and he gets saved and and it's, it's very likely, um, we're not told fully, and it's not spelled out in Scripture, but it's very likely that this Ethiopian unit goes back there, tells the queen about it, and uh, there's a big impact for Christianity in Ethiopia at that time, and through time from that point. Okay, now the Gentile, uh, number seven now, um, um, I want to just make a point there about that, that vision again with, with Peter and his trance and the whole household of Cornelius receiving salvation. The scripture says in Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through to 3, he saw clearly in the vision an angel of God. And um, the, the net result of that vision and Peter's trance and the connection that Peter and, and he made with the whole household is that Jesus was shared to that devout uh, Roman centurion who pray to God always. Now, that's good and that's right. And he was functioning in the revelation that he had of God through the Old Testament scripture and influence. But it was still important for Peter to go and preach Jesus to him. And when he preached the forgiveness of sins, when you check out that uh, sermon that Peter preached, halfway through the sermon or towards the end of the sermon or whatever, he was interrupted by the Holy Spirit, so to speak, who fell upon in an, in, a, in an embrace, which is what the original language brings out, on that whole household, and they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues and magnify God. It's incredible. The importance of sharing Jesus. Okay, so moving right along now to a, a further example here, the whole of Asia Minor, both Jews and Greeks, heard the gospel when we read the account given in Acts chapter 19. And this was within the space of two years, the whole of Asia Minor. So when it talks about Asia, it's talking about Asia Minor, which is where modern-day Turkey is and the original churches of the, of the book of Revelations are found. Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, this is the account, that the people um, um, heard the gospel and that... 
they, there was a, a daily reasoning of the gospel that took place in one of their um, places of learning called the School of Tyrannus. So read the account for yourself, Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. And they were found, the disciples, under Paul's uh, influence, leadership, were reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus with anyone who would listen. And this continued for two years. This is in, within the city of Ephesus, which is a port city, a strategic city, a gateway to the whole of Asia Minor. This continued for two years so that all, get this now, you either believe the Bible or we don't. So hopefully you believe the Bible. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, or as we know them, Gentiles. All who dwelt in Asia, Asia Minor, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That's how strong the influence was through that daily reasoning. You know, reasoning with the word of God, not mental reasoning without the word of God that kind of leads nowhere because mental reasoning without the word of God doesn't help. But reasoning with the word of God takes the gospel to every corner. Okay, having said that now, um, if we jump from the book of Acts to uh, a consideration, I don't have details to give you and it's just going to be too much in, the, in one session. But when you look at church history, Throughout the 20 centuries up to right now, the 21st century, you have accounts throughout all 20 centuries of God's people reaching out across the globe. For example, the Reformation that took place um, mostly in, in, in Europe and the subsequent uh, renaissance or reawakening of, of science and culture and writing and so on after a long period of the Dark Ages where the gospel was kind of repressed and hidden from the average person. Uh, the whole world was impacted by this reformation and subsequent renaissance. And missions movements and the spread of the gospel and the positive influences that the gospel had in society to uh, this opening up of the good news spread throughout all the world to all the continents at that time in many different waves. Absolutely fascinating study that certainly throughout all 20 centuries has happened, but a prime example was the Reformation and the Renaissance that followed. Getting down to modern times, right where we are now to kind of sum up and finish up. If you take satellites and cell phones and the modern, modern uh, transportation, you know, jets and whatever, uh, you know, the, the ends of the earth have been reached. And according to, just as a little fun thing here, according to UN data, more people on earth have access to cell phones today than decent toilets or sewage facilities. Interesting. Six billion people across the planet now have access to mobiles. Now, whether they've got them or not, it's another story. But they have access to them. Whereas only 4.5 billion have access to these working toilets, as I said. And 1.1 uh, billion of these people just do it out in the open. Presumably, many of them while talking on their mobiles. That's, uh, anyway, it's just a little on the side there. But, yeah, having said that, the opportunity for people today to receive Christian broadcasting the good news over the globe via satellite, and internet, regular cable, radio, mobiles, everything, it's just incredible. Okay, so to kind of conclude and make some reasonable conclusions. God has used His creation... He's used the inner longing of mankind for worship and meaning and significance and conscience and so on. And he's also used his people both in the Old Testament and certainly in this session, the New Testament, to reach all of mankind in all places at all times with his heart of love for them, the gospel. So it's fair to say that we have at least um, a challenge to 
to the hypothetical question, well, what about the people in who've never heard the gospel, supposedly? Well, we've seen some examples about how people have heard the gospel in all sorts of places, all sorts of times. Incredible. So, it's fair to say that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the scripture teaches. From whatever background, whenever, wherever. So, kind of as a, a practical application of this, how would you approach this matter with skeptics and questioners and seekers and people that are, you know, have genuine questions and others that are really antagonistic or whatever? Um, number one, we're called to be that living witness to the facts of Jesus' completed work. Um, we're just to witness to it. it. You know, it's not to argue about it. It's just to say, this is the way it is. Be a witness. He gives us the power to be that witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 talks about, I will give you power to be a witness. Not to go witnessing necessarily and shove tracks in people's faces, although you can do that if you want, but to be a witness. Your lifestyle, what you say, what you do, how you act, how you react, your perspective on life, everything is just a, a witness to God's goodness wherever you are. It's got Christians everywhere. Secondly, keep the focus on Jesus in their lives. The Holy Spirit will convict them. Don't try and prove to them, you know, scientific challenges and, you know, what about Jonah and the whale and the fish and things like that and Noah's Ark, you know, couldn't really have fitted all the animals in it and what about the termites, you know, did they start eating the wood? Probably not because of the pitch in it. Uh, so they would have just kind of gone into hibernation. That's my little take on that, whether you like that or not. Not a problem, but moving right along. Keep the focus on Jesus. Don't argue. Speak the word. Keep the channels of communication open. Make, make sure that you really do care about the people that you're speaking to. Don't ram something down their throat to win an argument. And uh, remind them that God is a righteous judge and that he's a loving father and he's not about to um, um, judge them with their questioning, he's, he wants to reveal himself as a loving Savior. So avoid that uh, judgmental spirit where they might be in their present lifestyle of sin or whatever it is. God desires that we speak from the a place of the mercy seat, uh, not the judgment seat. You know, he's the judge and he's judged sin on the cross in, in the person of Jesus Christ. So right now, our job is to witness to them of the goodness of God that will lead to their repentance from the mercy seat. And not to get drawn into these red herring arguments and hypotheticals about the topic, but certainly with what you know, give them some answers. Refer them to this uh, video if you're interested, or if they're interested. And focus on bringing the good news of Jesus, game-changing work of the cross to, to them. Uh, don't, um, you know, get bogged down in sort of secondary arguments and secondary revelations. Just keep the focus on Jesus. And engage with them where they're at and um, point them once again to Jesus and the Holy Spirit will do the work. So hopefully this has been a help to you. Um, I've enjoyed sharing it with you. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.